From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Raise your hand if you forgot there was a presidential election going on. With the world upside down, few could blame you if you had. And you may have missed the news that Rhode Island moved its uh, presidential preferential primary from April 28th to June 2nd. Joining me now live from the State House to talk about managing an election in the era of a pandemic is Rhode Island Secretary of State Nellie Gorbea. Secretary, it's good to speak with you and I hope everybody in your universe is healthy. Yes, thank you, Tim. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, yes, everybody thankfully is healthy at home and I wish the same to you and everybody else who's watching this important newscast. If we are in a somewhat similar situation that we are right now going into June 2nd, how is that election going to work? Is this going to be all mail-in ballots, Secretary, or are, we, are people going to be able to also vote in person? How are you managing this? So uh, my office is coordinating with the State Board of Elections and the local boards of canvassers to make sure that every eligible Rhode Island voter has the opportunity to cast a ballot in a safe and secure manner. This is why right now we're changing things around and making sure that people have the opportunity to vote by mail. And very soon people will be getting uh, a mail ballot application. Uh, that we've asked for them to return to us so that they can get a ballot at home. So my first uh, request is that people try to vote by mail. Uh, however, we can't undo the system completely and we do have to give people the opportunity to vote in person. And that's uh, being taken care of by the Board of Elections and the local boards of canvassers. They're doing a really good job to make sure that if people do have to vote uh, by emergency ballot or by um, in person, that, that they have the ability to do so. Let's talk about that process of doing the emergency ballot, doing the mail-in ballot. My understanding is people have to mail in an application in order to get a ballot sent to them. Is there any discussion, Secretary, about moving that process online so it is easier for people to just reach out to the state and say, yup, I want a mail ballot, uh, send that to me, instead of having to go through this entire snail mail process back and forth? Um, we have spoke, we have talked about it, uh, but we feel that at this time, given where uh, the system is, that, that this is the safest and most secure way to do it. Um, we will be mailing every registered voter uh, in the state uh, a mail ballot application. Some people may have already done it, that's fine, we'll take that into account. But we, for the rest of the people, we will be mailing them a mail ballot application. And then once we get that back from the voter, we've pay, paid for all the postage in this. So, and we've actually spoken with the post office. So all of this is going to be expedited as election related mail. Uh, my understanding is when you are, are doing the mail ballot, you have to get the signature notarized. Is that still going to be required? No, the Board of Elections at its last meeting um, asked, voted in favor of suspending that requirement, both the witness signatures or uh, a notary, because that would be that would have been very difficult during these times. So the what the voter has to do is to simply sign the ballot and put it into the mailbox, and, and before uh, the, uh, the the election, which is June second, and then we'll be able to count their ballot that way. There are some voters that can't use a mail ballot, uh, those voters with a disability. Will mm -hmm. they have an opportunity to go to a physical polling location to cast their ballot? Absolutely, yes. Um, anybody who either just didn't get their mail ballot in time or uh, wasn't able to, to do the procedure, and it, either because they have some sort of a disability and uses what we call the automark equipment, the ballot marking equipment, will be available in every city and town so we can make sure that every eligible voter has that opportunity to cast that ballot. You initially opposed moving the date. Uh, you were concerned that it could cause confusion and disenfranchise voters. Do you still have that concern? No, I mean, I think, you know, my, my concern was expressed a week before uh, the governor was able to take uh, a position on it. And so, um, you know, every day is, is a world of difference. And so I'm comfortable uh, 
given where we are right now, that we're going to be able to pull this off and we're going to be communicating heavily with all of the registered voters to make sure that everybody understands what the process is, what the deadlines are. The first thing I want to ask anybody watching this show is to go to vote.ri.gov and verify your voter information. Uh, we want to make sure that we have your right address, that we have your, the right party affiliation, and you can edit that online uh, and, and make those changes online so that you don't really have to go into any particular office to do that. If you already said this, Secretary, I apologize, but you know what, this information is worth repeating. Uh, what is the deadline to make sure you get in your application for a mail ballot so people at home know, okay, I've got to get this in the mail by X date? So the, the, the mail ballot, to, to file to get the ballot sent to you, that uh, we're working right now with the governor's office, we're hoping to make it May 19th. The ballot has to be received back at the Board of Elections by Election Day. So it's not postmarked, it's actually received at the Board of Elections. If it's three days before, two days before, the day before, your best bet is to actually drop it off at your city and town board of canvassers. And I'll ask you the reporter question on this one. You know how hungry we are for uh, returns and results. Uh, I know that's more of a board of elections thing, but I'll ask you since you're here, do you have <laughs> any idea of how this will impact uh, you know, the information coming to the public and who won, who lost, that kind of a thing? Yeah, I know, yes. It's, but, you know, I know that the Board of Elections is working on this. Um, they have made some additional equipment requests that we're looking into. Uh, but what we're hoping is, is that, you know, with the presidential preference primary, people pretty much know where they're going to be voting. Uh, and so, you know, if you know and you're sure, cast that ballot as soon as possible. The Board has extended the time period in which they process ballots from 14 days to 20 days. So if your ballot gets in 20 days before the election uh, 20 days before June 2nd we are the board will actually be able to put it through its machines and and have it pre-counted if you will the results are not known by anyone but they're able to process ballots ahead of the, the primary date so I do believe that they're taking safeguards to make sure you have quick results yeah that's an important note that even though they'll be counting ahead of time the, re the results won't be released until election day all right September and no November secretary you, you and I both know it's gonna be here before we even know it and yeah. uh, I was just wondering if what you're doing here for June 2nd in the Board of Elections what the state is doing I should say Boy, could this be a test drive for having to do it this way for the general election, for the presidential election in November? Yeah, I, I'm certainly not taking anything for granted. We're going to really examine this uh, presidential preference primary. We're going to learn from it. And there'll be things that, if we are still in the same situation, we'll be able to carry forward into September and November. There, you know there could be some talk as we approach November about you know access to polls versus mail ballots and maybe there could be a discussion I think I've already heard it already of moving that date back have you gone there yet in your mind and and where do you fall on that one I realize this is more of a national question but as the Secretary of State of Rhode Island could you see a scenario where they actually push the November, November elections back I really hope not. I think that, again, many jurisdictions are actually able to now test mail ballot systems. And uh, I, I would, I'm, I know I'm going to encourage our congressional delegation to the extent possible that we keep uh, the November uh, date uh, because it is really, really important that we carry on our democracy. Uh, but, you know, everything, you know, we do want to make sure that everybody's safe and secure and healthy. And it's really hard to predict the future these days. We're going to shift gears here, Secretary. You are the gatekeeper to public mm -hmm. records and the uh, open meetings policies for the state. And I know the General Assembly is immune to the Open Meetings Act. That's a conversation for another time. But they're, uh, they're, is, they're in the heart of the session right now, and they physically aren't, aren't meeting because of everything that's going on. The state GOP has recommended having the General Assembly meet in a large location like the Dunk or something like that to continue the important legislative process. For, from your perspective and handling open meetings policies, how should the General Assembly handle this? What is your recommendation to them? 
You know, I, I, I think they're the legislative leaders are looking at this uh, as we speak. I know that they take their responsibilities as elected leaders very seriously. And, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure that they're able to carry out, yes, um, the, the representation of, of people, uh, but to do it in a way that affords as many individuals as possible the opportunity to see and, and to hold their government accountable. Uh, so there are no quick fixes or silver bullets uh, in this, and I do, but I, but I would hope that they will find a way to, particularly with the budget, I know that they're looking at it very seriously. What about the bodies that do fall under the Open Meetings Act, Secretary? There are concerns mm -hmm. that remote meetings will choke off access, and certainly uh, transparency has taken it on the chin over the past couple of weeks. My colleague, Steph Machado, was covering the Providence City Council this week, and you know, look, it was hard to even understand what some of the city councilors were saying. There was uh, difficulty in accessing some of the policies that they were voting on. I'm guessing that you're getting phone calls from different town governments, city council, school committees. What's your advice to them about how to handle this situation? The biggest uh, advice that I have uh, for any elected official trying to hold a public meeting these days is is to communicate as much as possible with your the people you're representing. Um, and I want to give a, a, a shout out to both the governor and the attorney general for coming up with, you know, what I know it may seem to many as an imperfect solution with regards to the Open Meetings Act, but one that I think fits the nature of, of the crazy times that we're in. Uh, my biggest concern is that individuals know what's going on and how to access it. Uh, and we're learning as we go as elected leaders about how to represent people. Most of the people who are in these positions making the decisions, I believe, uh, are doing so in, in good faith. Uh, and so uh, we need to be able to provide answers to the press and to individuals as to why we're making the decisions we're making. We need to give voice to concerns by the public as to policies that are being decided at this time. Uh, and I do believe that that we will figure out a way to do this uh, a little bit by, you know, one step at a time. All right, Secretary, we have about one minute left, and I want to uh, take a moment to talk about something that I know you've been talking a lot about, and that is it's census time. Now is the time to be filling out your census. I did it just a few weeks ago. It only takes a couple of minutes. Uh, are you worried about the impact that the social distancing rules will have on the door-to-door -door canvassing that has to go on for the, the people that don't get around to filling out their census? No, I'm very concerned, absolutely. Um, and, and I know that there's efforts nationally to try to push back some of those deadlines that the census has as well. Uh, we need to make sure that everybody in Rhode Island is counted. Every single person, every baby, every senior, every young person uh, is money uh, from the federal budget. Uh, so let's make sure that while we're in these times of social distancing, look through your mail, find that form, and if you can't find it, you can still go to you, to the census uh, website at uh, census.gov, actually census2020.gov, and, and, and fill it out online or call them so that you can actually fill it out. Uh, so that's my big request of everybody watching this who hasn't done their census yet. Just go online and do it. Secretary of State Nellie Gorbea, thank you very much for joining us on the program. When we come back, we're going to attempt to digest one heck of a week of news. We'll be going back live to the State House to speak with Eyewitness News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. We go now back live to the State House. This time we are joined by Eyewitness News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Ted, good to speak with you again. Good to, good to not be with you, Tim, physically. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is becoming a habit. All right, look, uh, our viewers need yeah, to know exactly. we, we are taping on a Friday, and this week we saw a dramatic uptick in confirmed cases, Ted, and, uh, of course, an uptick in testing. Both of those obviously are related. Before we get into the economic impact of all of this, stepping back, what is your overall thought of what we learned from this week? Well, Tim, I think, you know, this week showed, I guess, two big picture things to me. One, the pandemic, the, the spread of COVID-19 and coronavirus is, is happening as, we, as people feared in the sense that it, it's going through the population as there are more tests being done. 
we are finding more people are COVID-19 positive. Uh, certainly the news Thursday and now this morning that we've reported about the uh, significant number of people affected at a couple of local nursing homes is alarming since those people are so are so vulnerable. But um, I think on the other end, as we talked about last Friday, the fact that the hospitals are not yet overwhelmed. There were only, I believe as of yesterday, 14 people in Rhode Island's ICU beds. There are about 188 of those beds total um, is a positive. You know, again, for another week, Rhode Island is not yet in a Seattle, New York situation where the hospitals are, are past capacity. But just like last week, I want to be clear, that could happen very quickly if the spread of the virus suddenly picks up or social distancing isn't, isn't followed as much as, as officials hope. So again, the, the longer Rhode Island gets uh, in any place without having a huge amount of spread, the better. But uh, we have to be prepared, I think, as a community for if it takes off quickly. And that brings up the conversation of projections, Ted. Our colleague Eli Sherman did a report this week on a University of Washington study on projections, both nationwide and state by state. And uh, that study found that they predict between April 19th and April 25th that Rhode Island could possibly see its peak in both cases and deaths. I noticed the governor got a little bit bristly about this topic earlier this week. Um, and I was wondering if, and she has asked Brown University to do their own projections, and we're still waiting on those on this Friday morning. But I'm wondering if, you know, projections are important, of course, to understand where we're going. But do you think the governor's concerned about what message these projections could send? Sure. Yeah, I think she doesn't want people to take to the bank uh, projections she fears are overly rosy. Uh, you know, you see a headline mid-April peak, people might say, okay, good, we got to do this for another week or two. And then by the end of April, kids can go back to school, we're all back at work, etc. Whereas the governor in her Q&A for children the other day uh, warned that while she hoped people could go to the beach this summer, it would be under new rules and the coronavirus will still be an issue. So I think, I think she's trying to manage expectations uh, about how bad this could get. And also, frankly, uh, you know, we, because they haven't released it we don't know what numbers she's looking at but presumably she sees something uh more more uh, something worse in the uh numbers that they're looking at as they do their projection so i think all of that is playing into her reaction to the university of washington numbers ted we have been you and i have both been getting a lot of emails from a lot of people who are hurting out there uh the latest numbers as of thursday a hundred thousand people tapping into unemployment insurance tdi tci that's a staggering what 10 percent of uh the rhode island population that is getting some sort of jobless benefit right now which is crazy but that helps you understand why you and i are getting so many emails for people who are trying to navigate that system and we have taken a different approach here at Channel 12. You and I are trying to help these people out one at a time, and then we're doing videos <laughs> online uh, answering their questions because of, I said a million times, if one person has a question, a thousand do. Let's go through a couple of the big questions that we're big, we've been getting for folks watching now um, that might not have seen those videos on WPRI.com. And I'll, I'll start with you. A lot of questions about that $600 that is, we should point out, an unemployment bonus. Some people are confusing that weekly $600 coming from the feds with the stimulus. Those are two different things. But a lot of people want to know if I'm on unemployment, Ted, and uh, you know I'm hearing about the $600 weekly check, what do I have to do to make sure I get that? So our understanding, Tim, is that you don't have to do anything to get the $600 once it's available. The problem is we just don't know when it's going to actually be available. The, uh, the CARES Act, that huge bill that Congress passed, passed about a week ago from when we are talking now. Uh, but the state labor departments, including the Rhode, Island labor of uh, the Rhode Island Department of Labor and Training, need the specific rules and regulations from the feds so they know how they are supposed to, supposed to distribute that since it is federal money and I just checked before we went on the air Friday morning and DLT still had not received this the the information they say they need to start giving that out um, so the good news is once it goes out it's supposed to be retroactive uh, so people should be getting it getting the $600 for this period when it hasn't been rolling out yet it ends July 31st but the bad news is we, we just can't give people a date certain yet when they'll see that money in their accounts but it's uh, you know you and I check in with DLT multiple times a day. We've exchanged probably uh, hundreds, it feels like, emails with Angelica Pellegrino, their very able 
uh, communications director, and I, I think th as soon as it's available, they're going to get that information out to folks. Yeah, and there are a lot of questions about that $600, if it's taxable, like other unemployment insurance uh, benefits are, other questions about if that $600 goes towards SNAP benefits. All of those things are still sort of up in the air, and we're working on that, as you say, Ted, to get answers for everyone. Well, I also, and I know you have been getting a lot of questions about that stimulus check for a lot of people that that'll mean $1,200 uh, for depending on your income that you get and then a certain amount of money per child. Uh, and we, I already saw some tweets, Ted, I don't know if you did, that some people are already seeing it uh, in their direct deposit uh, right now. Uh, and people are wondering. Wow, no, I didn't actually know that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just saw a tweet whether it's you know, true or not, that's, that's, uh, it, it might be starting <laughs> to come in. You always have to verify things on Twitter, I suppose, but, uh, you know. I wish I'd checked my account this morning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tweet it out if you got it, then you can inform everyone. Uh, people want to know if they didn't, you know, if there are a lot of people that actually don't, this money goes through the direct deposit that you would get as a refund for your, your taxes. And people want to know, well, I might not file tax, taxes. They're on disability or other reasons that they don't have to file taxes. And as you and I talked about online, you know, the government finds you, uh, and eventually it'll get there. But if you're not in the IRS system, it might take a little bit longer uh, than, uh, than, say, those who did file a 2018-2019 uh, tax return. So what we have been told is you will get the money if you're not in the system right now. It just might take a little bit longer. All right, Ted, how about those workers that fall through the cracks going back to unemployment? The 1099ers, the gig mm -hmm. eco economy workers. Uh, help should be coming their way, but Senator Jack Reed is very concerned. The Trump administration is just taking too long. Yeah, and I mean, you know, in fairness, I suppose to the Trump administration, uh, the, this is a $2 trillion bill that passed a week ago, uh, and usually government takes quite a while, but at the, Senator Reid's point is that Congress passed that because they need money to hit the streets basically immediately because of the cratering of the economy we are seeing right now. Um, and, it, you know, he's wondering why they can't just get quick rules out to the state labor agencies so they can give out the $600, as we already talked about, and set up this new temporary COVID COVID-19 emergency unemployment program. That's the one that is supposed to cover self-employed workers, 1099ers, uh, Uber drivers, and other gig economy folks. Uh, and again, just like with the $600, the Rhode Island Department of Labor and Training says they need the, the exact rules and regulations from the Fed so they know how the Feds want the money handed out. Uh, the, the best advice we can give on that, the Rhode Island DLT has a mailing list they've set up where they're going to email out the information once they get it on uh, how you sign up for those programs when they roll out that link is on our website it's on the DLT website and I think uh, that's the place we're sending people uh, who want more information on that when it rolls out that that seems to be your best bet I, at last check there were I believe almost 12,000 people had signed up for that mailing list which gives you a sense of how many others beyond the hundred thousand who've already signed up for benefits they can get are waiting for assistance the most common question we get is really not a question it's an expression of frustration so many people Ted are waiting to get through to DLT particularly on that teleserve line uh, for unemployment when people are trying to uh, say certify weekly that they are still unemployed so the benefits can keep coming in and the line is constantly busy this is a tough one and uh, a lot of people are getting frustrated what we have been told by the DLT is they're trying to increase capacity over there so they can handle those calls and they also put out a tweet Ted this week that said look if if you went online to teleserve online and you were told to call in because they need to manually verify something you're still going to get paid at least for the time being as they work all this out, which is an indication that they are well aware that their lines are bogged down. And, you know, when you hear some of the numbers, Ted, that we got this week from the spokesperson at DLT about how many calls they had to certify in just one day, you can understand why the lines are backed up. Yeah, we were told DLT got, I believe it was about 32,000 people called in on this past Sunday, uh, so a week ago for people watching us on Sunday, for to verify their benefits and get unemployment. So that's 32,000 in one day. They only had 12,000 in a week back in January. So uh, I think, and, and I will say, a lot of the people emailing us are, while they're very frustrated and, and often concerned, they need to pay their rent, their bills, they also do seem to understand that this is an unprecedented, uh, you know, even when we've had high unemployment in the past, in the past, it didn't all happen at once. That's what's crushing the systems right now. It's so many people at the exact same time. 
Ted, one minute left. You're standing in a ghost town right now. Usually they'd be getting the budget together in different finance committees. We touched on this with the secretary in the first half. The GOP is calling on Democratic leaders in the General Assembly to, uh, with some ideas to, to be able to get the legislature to meet again. What are they saying the General Assembly should do? It, well, you know, in short, there's been no decisions. I think it's very clear that uh, Speaker Mattiello and Senate President Ruggiero are wary of switching to some kind of remote or virtual meeting. Uh, they're worried about public participation. They are worried about just kind of making it not clunky with, with their members, et cetera. Uh, and the other thing in the Senate, they, I believe they think they, need to, they would still need to bring senators in to vote to allow that because it wouldn't be allowed under current rules. So there's complications. I think the bottom line for them is they are hoping that if the state makes some uh, progress on tamping down, flattening the curve on this, it will be acceptable with safety precautions to bring lawmakers back sometime later in the spring and get their work done in person here, but we have to see. All right, Ted, thank you very much. And as I said, we've been answering a mountain of your questions. You can watch our videos on WPRI.com and that you can learn how to get in touch with us as well. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.